Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 363, recorded August 17th, 2018, for September 7th, 2018. Ken Kashenda, Creative Selection. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Grammarly, the communication tool that helps improve your writing for every occasion. Start writing more confidently for work, for school, and even on the go. It's a great way to double check your important papers, documents, and even avoid future typos. Get 20% off Grammarly Premium today at grammarly.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is a show where we talk to the most interesting minds working in technology today. I am Megan Maroney, and I am honored today to talk to Ken Kashenda. He was the uh, principal engineer of iPhone software, worked for Apple for 15 years, and most recently, he's the author of Creative Selection, Inside Apple's Design Process During the Golden Age of Steve Jobs, which uh, just came out. I well, think. it's actually it's it's about the, right. So uh, it's it's coming out on September fourth. September fourth. September fourth. So it just right. This will be it's September fourth. Right September fourth. Uh, <laughs> September fourth. Right. Okay. Great. <laughs> so it is uh, available now at bookstores. Right. And uh, you read the audiobook as well. Right? I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. About two weeks ago, I went in and uh, three days. Um, uh, on uh, at a recording studio at Stanford. Yeah, I read the audiobook. So uh, um, hopefully that uh, that will come out <laughs> all right. I've heard a little bit. There's actually a clip uh, posted online. If you've got uh, like uh, show notes, we can mm-hmm. maybe put the uh, oh, put the the, the, the clip Excellent. of the introduction. Awesome. Um, so you have uh, one of my favorite backgrounds of engineers. You you went the liberal arts way. You were a, a history major at Yale. Um, fixed motorcycles, taught in Japan. How did you get from there to Apple? <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a roundabout course, yeah, for sure. Well, see, you know, I can pick it up from uh, uh, teaching English in Japan. Uh, part of the reason that I went to Japan was to develop a portfolio of uh, photographs. I was really interested in fine art photography at the time. It's what I spent a lot of time uh, uh, doing at when I was at Yale. I spent a lot of time in the art department as well as the history department. And uh, so my goal was to uh, apply um, uh, to get a Master of Fine Arts degree in photography and to teach. Um, And so I developed, I went to Japan, I lived there for over two years and uh, developed this portfolio of work and came back uh, to the United States and uh, attended uh, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. But see, the, the thing is, I, you know, I, for some reason, I hadn't really maybe thought this out as well as I should because my goal was to become a professor in, uh, in a fine arts program. Well, it turns out that at RIT at the time, they had an opening on their faculty. And there were 800 applicants. <laughs> and um, I did a little math. And I figured that, wow, boy, two years with my MFA, that's what the competitive landscape is going to be. And so I, I gave a, a hard think. And uh, I was somewhat fortunate to be at RIT, which was not just an art school, but also a school, school of technology. And so right around that time, um, uh, the printing industry was uh, undergoing a big change, trying to bring computers more into the process. So I figured, well, hey, I'll do digital prepress. I'll learn how to make photographs look good when they're printed, you know, sort of ink on paper sort of thing. And uh, so I, I transferred out of the fine arts program into this uh, printing technology program, but I only stayed there for one semester. So I did one semester in the fine arts program, one semester in the printing technology program, because then this was 1994, I discovered the web. It's like, okay, now I'm going to make photos show up on the web. And just one thing led to another. I uh, started making, learning HTML and making websites. And uh, so I transferred from the printing program to uh, an information technology program. I uh, just did a year, didn't get a degree, but I learned enough about the web to go get a job. And yeah, just one, th- one thing led to another. So that was sort of the, the, the mid to late 90s were not the best years for Apple. But. No, indeed. No, indeed. You know, and the, the thing is, I, I always had Macs. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. But um, for a little while there, I was working at a web technology company and I was doing some Java programming. Mm -hmm. And I actually um, changed out my Mac for a, a Windows NT machine. So for about a year, I was not using Macs every day. I still had one at home. Around that time, I had a G4 Cube. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it wasn't the best time to be, uh, you know, sort of an Apple enthusiast at, at, at the time. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of a low ebb. And by the time you started at Apple, um, was Steve back? Okay, so then okay. that's jumping ahead uh, a, a number of years. So uh, so I rattled around a little bit um, doing, uh, making websites and doing Java development uh, and uh, did a couple of startups and uh, eventually a couple of startups of my own, which none, none of them really worked. And so the last startup was uh, one called Easel which was founded by um, Andy Hertzfeld. Uh, Bud Tribble was also uh, a, a principal at the company, as was Mike Boich, and those three worked on the original Mac at Apple in the 80s. And so I joined the company to work with them. And so their, uh, the idea of Easel was to uh, make Linux uh, on the desktop work. Well, that didn't work out so well. So once that company um, was, was finished, I, I think, I, I've never, I haven't spoken to Bud about it, but I think what he did was we had about 75 engineers. We did a round of layoffs, but um, uh, there were a, real, a lot of really smart people. I think what Bud Tribble did was he called Steve on the phone and said, well, we're shutting down the company. We've got a, a number of really smart people working here. Um, and Apple threw a, a job fair. So I, that was the first time that I was ever on the Cupertino campus. Mm -hmm. And I hired on. And there you go. So that was 2001. Oh, wow. And you started as an engineer. I started as an engineer, yes. Mm -hmm. And and the day I started, the project that I started on was to, um, was to develop Safari. I mm -hmm. started with Don Melton. Uh, and uh, he was the manager. And I was his team. And the two of us um, set out trying to figure out how to make Apple a web browser. It's so, f I mean, I, until I read your book, I had forgotten that 2001 was the, the year that, or did it come out in 2002 or 2001? So that, that project was, uh, was about 18 months long. So the, the beta release of Safari at, uh, at Macworld was in January 2003. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So 15 years old. It is, yeah, it's yeah. 15 years old now. <laughs> and so to answer your question before, so now by that point, Steve had been back at Apple for around four years. Mm -hmm. So 96, 97. Um, and so he was, I don't know if he's still technically the ICEO. He was uh, there at the time, but he yeah. was, you know, firmly in control. And, uh, and, and yeah, set us that, that project, making the web browser. So we did. So with your background, I mean, you have this amazing background in history and photography, and I know you worked on Safari, and you worked on the iPhone and the iPad and the Apple Watch. Did you ever have any involvement in the camera in the iPhone? I mean, the camera that obviously has really changed history, the history of photography that, you know, that you had it's, written about. It's, it's true. It's true. So, so uh, the, the, the short answer is not, no, not back in that time. I did do some uh, early prototyping for portrait mode. Mm. Uh, once uh, uh, I was told that you know the uh, uh, we were going to be, uh, uh, I, I still say I we we Apple that Apple uh, was going to be putting two cameras on the back of uh, of an upcoming iPhone, and so I got an early prototype and worked with a couple of people in the design studio to try to figure out what to do, mm -hmm. uh, and so. Um, uh, I came up with this uh, with this idea. See what happens is what, when the two the two cameras what they do is they uh, produce a depth map, and so it's it basically a grayscale image which you never see. Mm -hmm. uh, but both cameras both cameras fire and and it it creates this um, this uh, uh, using just the parallax but the, you know the difference uh, you know between the uh, the placement of the two cameras to to figure out depth and so it produces this grayscale image I forget what it was it's like you know white is right against the lens and black is infinity it's either that or the reverse with grayscale in, in between and so I did some uh, some early experiments to figure well what could you do with it and so simulating depth of field was one thing mm -hmm. uh, we did some uh, other experiments um, you know which you know, it may or you know may not be coming out in in, in the future, mm. but that certainly uh, that certainly came out to try to simulate simulate the you know depth of field and you know 
give you uh, give you some nice portrait effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are. They yeah. are nice. and, and some 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 great great people working the design studio on that. Uh, Johnny Manzari is uh, one fellow mm -hmm. who's done uh, still at Apple, I believe, and and his name. He's actually done a couple of interviews. Apple's that let him uh, speak. Oh. Uh, 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 publicly about the work on the camera and the photo effects because I, I think he's just done great work so it's great to see mm -hmm. his uh, his name out there yeah yeah so going back a, another decade and and then some uh, going back you have a great section in the book about Richard Stallman like just mm. um, sort of I, I mean you you introduced him rightly so to people because some people might have not been familiar with his influence and um, you know but it's it, it he was a name that everyone was throwing around in the early 2000s sure so Talk a little bit about what influence he had on you and the work that you did. And well, he's had he, he's had a tremendous influence on the entire computer industry, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, the, the whole notion of free software is, uh, I, I think, one of yeah, it is it is one of the the foundations of the internet as we know it today, for sure. Uh, uh, the uh, Linux, of course. Uh, is the whole Linux development uh, project is driven by the, the GPL, the General Public License, mm -hmm. which is um, really the fundamental notion that Richard Stallman came up with. It's this, this idea that, uh, that, that software should be free, uh, and it's free as in freedom. That it's freedom as a, uh, th that the software is free uh, as, a, as a, a, not only a technological good, but as a social good. That uh, that a lot, a tremendous amount of intellectual effort goes into creating software, and um, if you begin to, as you know, as many companies do, of course, you know, uh, match up the profit motive with that software development, well, maybe the world isn't getting as much use of all again all of that intellectual effort as as it might, and so. Um, uh, you know, Stallman came up with this idea, and of course, he's he's lived his life by it. That mm -hmm. that you can uh, you can devote your life to software, and uh, as he has, and still somehow <laughs> still somehow manage to uh, you know put put food on the table, mm -hmm. um, uh, support yourself, um, and you know part of the trick there is to figure out well how can you build a business around. Um, um, you know, other perhaps ancillary services, or you know, other uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, other ways of generating revenue that is not directly tied to selling the software. Mm -hmm. You know, so companies like Red Hat, you know, mm -hmm. to this day are, are doing this with with Linux support contracts or big enterprise clients. Um, Richard Stallman's a bit of a unique case in that you know he is uh, you know famous as an advocate, but you look at Linus Torvalds himself, mm -hmm. right? He is um, the head of a, of a huge free software project and. I think probably uh, Lin, you know, Linus is uh, doing okay, and and yet and 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 the world gets to benefit from the uh, you know his intellectual output, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, you know, and so so for for me personally, you know, I I went and I talk about in the book how Richard Stallman's uh, influence uh, and free software uh, made me go and um, join a company like Easel that was mm -hmm. you know attempting to uh, create. Uh, a, 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 a wonderful desktop Linux system for people. Unfortunately, the company didn't succeed, but one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. And eventually we, we wound up using free software at Apple to make Safari. Mm -hmm. And OS X as well? Like OS X was built on the Linux kernel? Am I remembering no, that wrong? No, no, okay. no. OS, OS X is, is, built on, uh, is built on Mach, okay. which is um, software that, uh, that Avi Tavanian, Avi Tavanian uh, developed when he was, uh, I believe he was a, a, a student at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. And then that went and was the software uh, infrastructure at Next. Okay. And then that, uh, so the Mach uh, kernel... It. Um, is what uh, forms the core of uh, Mac OS X. Mm -hmm. But Mac OS X has a tremendous amount of free software mm -hmm. um, um, in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, Mac, uh, the, the, the Mac ships with a whole host of free software uh, projects. Um, you know, t t Web WebKit mm -hmm. is a uh, is is certainly an open source project. Uh, the printing architecture uh, there is uh, the revision control uh, mm -hmm. software. Uh, for for many years, the compilers mm -hmm. uh, were free software, and on and on and on. There's a whole host of free software. Mm -hmm. Um, you do. You, there are great illustrations. Now, who, remind me who did the illustrations in your book. So, um, so there's a fellow uh, named Guy Shield who is uh, based in Australia, 
and um, uh, I, I met him through a, a colleague. I, I decided that, oh well, gosh, boy, it would be great to uh, to get some uh, to get some graphics in there. I think of the of the illustrations as like film stills. Uh -huh. You know, as I I try to do the best I can to set the scene in words, but there were some places that I thought it would be great to get you know, an actual image to go along with it. Well, here's so, the one of Richard Stallman. Um, right. Can we take a look at that, Karsten? Um, and I just love it because he is the cashier at a candy store. Right. <laughs> and so, and as you can see, in the uh, the cash register is uh, registering zeros <laughs> because the software is free. Right. And so the idea of this, um, uh, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm a child of the 70s. And so uh, the image in my mind for this photo uh, comes from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> so if you, you know, the opening scene, they're in the candy store, right? And so, um, so it's, you know, sort of inspired by that. Um, and, and so to, to uh, um, uh, sort of position Richard Stallman as the, uh, the guy up at the front of the free software candy store, that the software is, you know, to, as, as a programmer, I look at, at the, just the wealth of wonderful software that people uh, spend their lives developing and mm -hmm. then, you know, make it out, put it out there for free so that I can take advantage and then contribute my uh, improvements back to the community. Um, and that Richard Stallman is there, you know, having developed the whole notion of free software and the GPL, which keeps the, the whole software, free software mechanism going. And he's at the cash register making sure that everything works, right? We're not there to take money, mm -hmm. but to make sure that the free software mechanics continue to work. Mm -hmm. Zero dollars, but the you know people contribute back in kind. Right. So when you uh, started at Apple, um, that you describe it as every day was like going to school. And um, you said that you know, at the time, Apple was sort of the company where you might have used a, a, a Mac or, you know, an, an uh, Apple computer in your in college. But, you know, once you got a real job, you were back to PCs. It sort of made me think it's like, you know, oh, I experimented in college, but now I'm... <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so describe what it was like when you first started there. Right. Well, it, Apple was a very different company. Uh, uh, there, there were no iPods yet, so I started in June of 2001, and the iPod didn't come out f uh, for another four months. So the Mac was the company's only product, and so Apple was an underdog. Mm -hmm. uh, the company's market share was below 5%. Uh, the, the the industry was still dominated by Microsoft and Windows, the you know the Wintel duopoly, and so um, we were trying to figure out how to make ourselves relevant. Mac OS X had just come out mm -hmm. three months before, right? Again, the iPod wasn't out yet, so it was at this point where Apple was you know, setting the stage for uh, the su success the success that we were going to try to make. But um, all of that was still in, 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 in the future. So we, we felt like we were underdogs. I mean, you know, to even just give you a sense. Uh, so I started at Apple in 2001. In 2002, there was like a hiring and salary freeze. Mm. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, today, Apple, the trillion dollar company, yeah. right? Seems like it has all the money in the world. But, you know, but back then it was very, very different. We were underdogs. Right. So the development of Safari... Um you, uh, what, what was that like? Were, were there, a, how, how long, you said it was, you started working in 2001 and, mm -hmm. and launched in 2003. Um, right, right. And so um, the, uh, the, the goal we were set uh, when Don Melton and I started was make a web browser. And I had never worked on one. So well, how do you do that? Well, thankfully, I started working with Don, uh, who, uh, whose experience, he, I, I also worked with him at Easel. Um, and his experience before that was at Netscape. So he was involved in uh, taking Mozilla uh, to uh, be a, from a closed source to an open source project. So Don had experience uh, making web browsers. And so from the start, uh, we, we set about saying, well, um, we're a two-person team. How are we going to make this, this, this huge project? And so Don had a plan that, well, we were going to go and survey the landscape, and one of the big ideas was to go and look for an open source project mm. um, and, and leverage that um, and, and use just you know, his effort and mine to try to get ourselves bootstrapped really, really quickly. 
you know, stand on the shoulders of the of the the, the, the companies like Netscape with Mozilla, which mm -hmm. with their source code, and try to figure out if we could take that and 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 make an Apple browser out of it. So that's how we started. So at the time, there was Internet Explorer, but no Chrome at that point. Right. No, there was uh, Internet Explorer was the default browser on the Mac, uh, and again, Mac OS X had shipped. So that was the browser. I mean, it was, I think, Finder, Mail, Internet Explorer mm -hmm. were the three apps on the dock. And so our job was to replace Internet Explorer. And um, so, you know, we, we, we started with some open source ideas. And, yeah, we kind of ran into a couple of, uh, I ran into, a, you know, a bit, of a, a bit of a roadblock getting that going. Um, and really, the, the breakthrough moment came about six weeks later when uh, the third person uh, joined the team. So Don and I, uh, during that first six weeks, you know, it sounds like it's a short amount of, like it's a short amount of time, but um, we were expected to really get quick results. And we didn't really have any. We were looking at Mozilla. I was trying to get it to build on OS X. It didn't. We were looking at, so Don was doing some negotiations with some closed source vendors to see if we could license their code. Um, and we were really, we were, we were struggling. We weren't really making any progress. And then the third person joined our team, Richard Williamson. And in two days, he had found, we had told him about our progress. He went out and found yet another open source project, KDE from the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the KDE browse, KHTML from the KDE project, which is another list, Linux desktop development, uh, uh, Linux des desktop system, I should say. And he downloaded their browser, Conquer and made this incredible demo in two days and got it got it running mm -hmm. um and as i say in the book it was like it, it was like richard called us into his office he set a crystal ball down on the desk like waved his hand over it and showed us the future he just got this browser up and running and he yeah had it working on the mac and he was clicking links and and surfing web page, web pages he had made a couple of shortcuts but um it was this amazing programming tour de force to just get this browser you know uh, up and running and it was it was like showing us the future so we got started on that mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I love about your book it's not just a history of Apple but it's also um, a great guide to a career like what what a career might look like so after Safari you had sort of a, a downtime there were mm. um, you talk about this there was um, there was a promotion that you didn't get. You thought of leaving. You went to interview at Google. You felt like you had a, a more fair interview process at Google. Yeah, more I did interview at Google. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, they kept me there almost like two full days. Yeah, and it really put me through my paces. Yeah, and sure. offered you a job and asked you to and offered, your salary. And uh, offered, me, <laughs> offered me a job. It's, you know, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a funny story. So the recruiter, Google recruiter calls me up. So I'm in my office at Apple. Um, and uh, you know, so I, you know, I shut the door, you know, and 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 she she actually offered me the job right over the phone, and said and and said, well, Ken, what kind of salary do you want? Which kind of seemed like, well, gosh, don't you want to invite me in? It's yeah. like, well, we'll talk about this, you know. She said, she said, no, so Ken, I want you to go right now. She said, think big for like salary and stock it's just well I don't know but it's like actually by that point I'd already decided to stay at, at Apple so I, I thanked her I didn't I, I don't even know I, I, I should I should have I thought big but I just wound up not doing it because I by that point I'd already decided to stay at Apple yeah well that's some bad I, I feel like I've gotten that bad advice in my career well if you don't want to do a job just ask for like a ton of money right. well you know see I've never I part of it is I've never looked um uh, you know, my, my, you know, my salary Apple was, was good. Um, I, I don't know what they were to, to offer at Google, but, you know, beyond that, it was never really about the money. Mm -hmm. It was never about, you know, hey, can I parlay this into just, you know, I'm making, uh, I don't know, you know, twice or three times. I have no idea what, should, what they would have offered. But it was really just more about the work. It was more mm -hmm. about just doing interesting work. And you said that they recognized that at Apple, that you were more interested in projects than, yeah. than politics. Right. Right. Well, you see, the 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 reason why I, I I never thought big for the Google recruiter was uh, in the meantime, um, I I had a long conversation with Scott Forstall, mm -hmm. who was um, um, you know, a couple of levels higher up in the in, in the management chain from me at that point. And uh, he had heard that I, you know, I was maybe thinking about leaving. I don't know how these, you know, how these things get around, <laughs> but but they did. And uh, he and I had a long talk, and he just um, he wanted to find out what um, what made me tick. And he discovered that I really liked projects. And so he said, "Okay, 
I think I've got maybe a project for you. It's going to take a couple of weeks to work it out. Just don't do anything. Stay here. I want you to stay. You know, you're, you know, you're, you know, I, you're important to me. And so we'll, we'll get back together and talk about a project. But I mean, it was really that, it was that, that personal touch that, that made the decision for me to stay at Apple. Yeah. And I do think so many people sort of get lost in that. Like they, they do, you know, I think many people are more interested in projects than politics, but then you seem like once you get a certain point in your career, like you have to start climbing up and then you're not doing what you love anymore. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I really, I didn't do that. <laughs> Really it seems to have worked that. out. <laughs> I really, I really didn't do that. I mean, in, 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 you know, I, I had, as I talk about in the book, I had one short stint at Apple for just a couple of months where I was a manager. But uh, other than that, I was an individual contributor the, the whole time just working on projects. Yeah. And, and trying to, um, you know, not, I mean, every, every place has politics. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Apple is um, remarkable. Um um, for um, having as little of it as it does, right? I mean, you know, it's you know, you know, it's you know, it's like you know, it's like one of those you know little cliches. It's right, you know, it's like you know, it's, you know you have one person, you know, as you know, is by himself. You know, it's two people. You can have a conversation. Three people. You have politics, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, Apple, you know, uh, is is a very big company, and and like I said, has it, it does a very good job to, at, at temping that down. But it's it's inevitable that there is some of that. Um, um, but there is a track, and, and I went along it for uh, many years where I could just focus on, on doing the best work that I could. And so was the next project the iPhone? Well, um, after, um, uh, you know, I, I, I worked on Safari. I did uh, then a HTML ed editing project for Safari, adding uh, uh, um, uh, text editing to WebKit. And then I had this little um, break um, uh, of being a manager. And um, then after that, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, um, 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 how I wound up not being a manager anymore, it's, I, I discovered that I didn't like it as much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I missed programming uh, every day. I, I wound up, yeah, having to worry about people more than code. And uh, it was just something that I didn't take to. And so I just decided um, to, um, get back to coding. Um, and so I went to my manager at the time, Henri Lemureau, who I talk about in, you know, in, in the book in, in a couple of different uh, situations. This is certainly one of them. Um, and I said, well, Henri, I don't want to be a manager anymore. I, I, I just want to do something else. And, and I was just adamant. And he was like, well, wait a minute. You just got, you know, took this management job just a couple months ago. Uh, but I was, you know, I just you know, put my foot down. And he's like, what are you talking about? You just you know, took on this other job. So he said, well, wait a minute. And he went away and talked with Scott. I went and talked to Scott and, and, um, they decide, you know, a, a, you know, a couple of days later, you know, they, they were you know, pretty miffed at me that I was just going to give a, you know, leave them in the lurch on this management role that I had just taken. But then they came, um, Henri came a, a couple of days after that and he came in and he, uh, put a piece of paper, uh, down on the table between us. And he said, Ken, sign that. And it's like, well, uh, what is it? You know, so I, you know, it's a, it's a non-disclosure agreement. So I sign it, and he said, uh, "Yeah, we're making a cell phone, and now, now you're on the project. <laughs> and it's called Purple, and yeah, now you're on it." Yeah. And so, yeah, so then that's how I start, got started working on the iPhone. Yeah. Is I, um, I, I pushed my managers to the point where I had threatened to resign and I, I had fully expected them to let me and instead they gave me this terrific opportunity to work on um, kind of a dream project. And so that you had no idea or were you, did you think that they were working there was, for their you know, there was There was kind of like on the grapevine, but I didn't know. I really didn't know. Uh, you know, I, I had heard that, you know, maybe there was this, you know, this big, you know, important project going on, but I, I didn't, I didn't know for sure. And so as I, as I say in the book, it was, you know, it was part of my very bad negotiating when I told Henri that I wanted to work on a different project. Hey, if I can get working on this super secret project that I've heard a little bit about, 
uh, maybe I won't quit and go to Google and whatever. And he's like, who is, what, what is with this guy? <laughs> he just asked for one thing and we gave it to him. We made him a manager and now he's working, asking for something else. It's like, this guy's nuts. But, um, but they relented, um, mm -hmm. thankfully. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very thankful to them for doing that. And were, were there people also working on the iPad already at that time? Yeah, well, you know, there, that, that's part of the lore that I only know second and third hand mm -hmm. is that, um, the uh, multi-touch originally, well, first of all, it started out as, as, as a project that they were laying out on tables with cameras pointed from, uh, from above. I never saw that. Um, um, but I, I know people firsthand, uh, secondhand for me, but I know people who were working on that. Um, and, and, and so the idea was maybe to use that as a tablet. Um, but then um, a couple of key um, developments, key breakthroughs were made. Um, one of them was inertial scrolling mm. um, uh, with uh, rubber banding at the end and um, the other was a springboard, you know, so an icon launcher um, and so um, you know, uh, you know, again, the, you know, the, you know, the lore that, you know, that I've heard is, you know, Steve, Steve saw those two things and said, you know, we can actually make a whole touchscreen system mm -hmm. that you can have maybe a long list of, list of contacts and you can scroll through them with this beautiful touch interface, touch one and make a phone call. It's like, we, 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 we can do this. We can make a phone. And so that's when the iPad, you know, the tablet was put on the shelf and, um, attention was uh was was redirected into making a phone and not long after that yeah that's that's when this um um nda got put on the table in front of me within a couple of months after that that then when uh, i joined they decided to hire some more people and start going on it in earnest and so you were the head of the team that um the keyboard team the people that came. Oh uh, yeah, I was, I was head of the I was head of the keyboard team. There was a, a keyboard team of one. You, so yes, I was, so yes, I was the head of it. Yeah. But tell the story I, about how you got to be the, the the head of this team of one. Right, right. Well, see, the part of the 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 idea, what you need to know is that there were so few people working on software for uh, what I would term the the high level software, the user interface software. Um, and I would term that as, you know, anything, you know, so from a technical standpoint, anything from core animation on up. Um, and, and so everything from the low level graphics, you know, everything that users can see and touch, um, um, apps, and then uh, eventually the, the frameworks that developers were using. Um, that's what, that's what, uh, that's the team that I was on. And when I started, there were only six or eight of us. Mm. And, uh, to, you know, people were joining a little bit. And so that was everything. That was apps. You know, we were working on notes. We were working on Safari and Springboard and Mail and Calendar. And so, and so I mean, there were more apps than there were people at the time. And so then there were also, there was also UIKit. Uh, and and so even though that was not uh, made for developers at that point, they, we were we were making UI kit for ourselves uh, uh, frameworks, and so then there were uh, system level features like the keyboard, mm -hmm. and so there were uh, two fellows working on that, and um, and but they had lots of other responsibilities on their plate as well, and so um, the way we worked is that you know everything was demos. Um, we, we did very, very few paper mock-ups. We didn't draw on whiteboards. We made live demos of everything. And so what would happen is at that point, gosh, like twice a week, uh, Scott Forstall would lead a team. Um, uh, um, uh, Henri, who was heading up the, the, the software engineers, and Greg Christie, who was heading up the human interface team, the HI team, uh, as we called it, uh, the small team of designers. And, you know, so probably about, a, you know, a, a dozen or 15 of us would go around in a little posse, go uh, visit engineers either in their offices or the designers, you know, in, the, in their studio and look at demos. And so one day there was a very difficult keyboard demo where uh, Scott was was trying to type, and, and and so we had these devices, and so I'll you know I'll I'll pick up a pick up a you know an original iPhone here because that's about the form factor of the device, and so uh, the devices had a tether coming out of it like a thirty pin connector, mm -hmm. but it was it was uh, actually not a thirty pin connector. It just kind of looked like one. Maybe the the cable was a little bit thicker, and it was tethered to um, 
a board, a bare computer board that was sitting on your desk, and then that was connected by USB to a Mac. Uh, and, and this uh, device that you'd hold in your hand was just a display screen, but it was touch sensitive. Mm. And uh, with the Mac and the board and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, d the display screen, we could get our software running and you could hold it in your hand and use it. And so Scott had this keyboard demo in his hands and it just wasn't working mm. very well. And so um, he was trying to type and trying to type and failing at it. And eventually he got to the point where he like held the screen up to his face and was trying to type an S <laughs> to try to like, type his name, Scott. And he's like, he couldn't. He just, just couldn't. So he, he put the wallaby down and we went o out over to the next demo, to the next office. And um, well, we didn't think anything of it. Sometimes demos went well, and sometimes they went poorly. And you know, we everybody gave their feedback and whatever, and we just moved on. But a couple of days after that, uh, Henri uh, called everybody out, uh, all the software engineers, out into uh, the hallway, uh, out of our offices, and he said, "Okay, everybody, stop what you're doing. Stop working on Safari. Stop working on Notes and Calendar and Springboard. Every day, stop. Everybody from right now is a keyboard engineer." Mm -hmm. Progress is too slow. We need to step up um, the attention on keyboards. So um, everybody just needs to t start making prototypes of keyboards. And so we did. I went away and started, made, started making prototypes, and so did everybody else. And um, uh, you know, we, we went around and were showing them to each other informally as we did. That's just the way that we worked. So I would come up with an idea, show it to a teammate, and, you know, and, and it was like, no, that's terrible, you know, throw it out. And, uh, but eventually the, the goal was, you know, through this, you know, this is good, this is terrible, you know, improving these demos. Um, we were all pointing toward um, a, a big demo. We, were, we would take the, the, the ones that were more successful and Scott would try them out. It'd be like a keyboard derby, as I call it in the book, uh, where Scott would try them all out. And so uh, he did. And um, I tell the story, I almost don't want to spoil it for, mm -hmm. for, for readers, um, but eventually he uh, picked mine as the winner. Uh, and so from that point, I became what's called in Apple speak, the DRI, the directly responsible individual. <laughs> I became the DRI for keyboards from that point. And so, yeah, I became the keyboard team. And uh, everybody else went back to what they were doing. I mean, again, by that point, I mean, there's as many, as many people as there were apps almost. Um, and so, uh, yeah, keyboards became my job and everybody else uh, uh, resumed their regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> and so your keyboard, the way you describe it in the book, and I won't go into, I won't be too much of a spoiler, but it was like a telephone sort of, like each key mm. had three letters, right? So it's right. how you used to spell words on the keyboard right. of your telephone. Right, right. Well, the, uh, the big challenge, I, I would say one of the biggest challenges for developing the, the touchscreen operating system uh, as we did was, you know, as you're holding this device in your hands, and you have to remember, I mean, we, we all forget what the experience was like in that um, when you were aiming at a target on the touch screen and you went at it with your finger, well, your finger is covering up the target that you're going for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now we, we somehow have confidence that, you know, we can just type away and the software will figure it out. But back then we always felt this, this twinge of apprehension. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, gosh, should I get the right thing? And that, you know, and again, you know, our software, you know, everything was in a prototype phase. Nothing really worked all that well. We were discovering how things should work. And so, um, you, you know, one of, it was actually Richard Williamson who, um, uh, as we were going through that development phase when we were going from office to office showing each other prototype keyboards, he just said, no, 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 none of these small key keyboards are working. The keys need to be bigger. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to see them and tap them uh, with confidence. And so, yeah, so we developed this idea that, well, if you just have instead of 10 keys across, right, you know, QWERTY, right, you know, um, that maybe just have, say, three keys across or four keys across. Um, so the keys are big. You can see them. You won't completely block them with your fingers, even if you have fat thumbs. And that, you know, somehow we'll write some software to figure out, well, which, which letter did you mean? 
um, on these multi-key keys. So yeah, I mean, their T9 was you know kind of an idea mm -hmm. like this. Um, and so we experimented with that, and that was actually um, the, the keyboard that was picked um, as that derby winner. So there were a lot of people at the time, and I wonder if there were people inside Apple. I, I admit to being one of them. I always had Macs, and I loved them, but I, I felt attached to the mechanical keyboard, like the keyboard mm. on my palm, the physical keyboard. Not that right. I, I, I do like mechanical keyboards right now, but um, but you know, for my phone, the um, I wanted the physical keyboard. Were there people inside that were just like, this is never going to work, people will never give up on the physical <sighs> keyboard on their phone? Well, the whole... The goal was to make people forget about their hardware keyboards. Mm -hmm. That was the goal. Uh, that was my goal. I think that was Steve's goal because uh, Steve saw that if we could make the keyboard software, it meant that we could take that part of the screen and when the, uh, and and give it to apps so that when the when the, the the keyboard isn't needed, right? It can just get out of the way. And and you have a bitmap display and we can show whatever we want with those other pixels. And so did we think that we could do that? Well, there were doubts. Um, there were a lot of doubts. I mean, we called it kind of a science project, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I, you know, kind of evoking, yeah, it's like gurgling test tubes and you know lab coats, and we, you know, we weren't we weren't sure that we could make it work, but it was it was a bet that we could. Mm -hmm. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Grammarly. Grammarly has saved me so many times, and I consider myself a pretty good writer, but it has found things that. I was just amazed that it found like a, a, sometimes I'll use a product name and it'll have a capital letter in the middle of it. And I didn't know that. And Grammarly knows that it's really amazing. I should probably tell you what Grammarly is before I'm telling you how great it is. It's the communication tool that helps you improve your writing for every occasion. Grammarly helps you write more confidently, whether you're writing for work or for school or even on the go. They have a free version That'll help get you started. It's available across all platforms, including online, desktop, and your mobile device. Grammarly's premium version also allows users to track their writing skills and progress over time. We all love to track everything about ourselves. It's the quantified life these days. So why not track how much better Grammarly is making you at writing stuff. In addition to spelling and grammar, Grammarly Premium helps with advanced punctuation, structure, style within context, vocabulary suggestions, conciseness, readability, and readability for all different kinds of occasions. So whatever you're writing for, if you're writing, if you're trying to write more casual, if you're trying to write more business-like, it knows, you, you can tell it what you want, and then it judges your grammar that way. And I say judge, but it doesn't really judge. It's not harsh. It's not like me if I were going to correct your grammar. It's it's nicer than that. 76% of surveyed premium users now find writing more enjoyable. So you probably want to know now how to get Grammarly. Hopefully I've convinced you. Grammarly.com slash triangulation. You get 20% off Grammarly premium today. That's Grammarly.com slash triangulation. And we thank Grammarly for their support of triangulation. So uh, this, I want to talk about the specter of Newton. The, the Newton, um, you know, if you're an Apple fan, you know the Newton was, I, I keep holding my hands like this, but it was probably around that size, right? It was oh, like- Oh gosh, the, boy, you know, so I brought, I brought props. You know, I should have brought my Newton. <laughs> yes. I, I didn't. Well, a, a, well, next time, okay. next time I'll have to come back um, from the Newton. So it was the first uh, handheld computer, I guess, um, or it's one of the first. Certainly an early one. Yeah. So, you know, a PDA, right. You know, mm -hmm. and oh right. yes. And then, so part of why it failed was the text input. And so you talk about in the book, how you were sort of all living under that. Well, if this fails, the whole project's going to fail. So we better make right. text. Input. Well, I mean, I, I think if, if people remember the Newton today, they remember it for its faulty handwriting recognition. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, it, it this even, uh, Part of the, you know, it's like the Newton never. Oh, so we have we have Newtons. Yes. <laughs> okay. oh, oh, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. A right. Dusty. But, yeah, it's, um, it's dusty. Well, there, one, there, there you go. So, right. What's well, all oh, this is? This is marvelous. I mean, this is actually great. I mean, it's it's you know part of the reason why I why I brought brought these uh, brought these along. How can we get these on here so we can yeah, see? I think it's to them. just get you know just to get the uh, yeah yeah just to get the form factor difference. It's it's actually great to see the. Uh, the Newton down there with the, the iPods <laughs> and, the, and the phones and the iPads. 
uh, wonderful. And so, um, and so the uh, the idea, of course, is that the uh, you know the Newton is that you pat you know mm -hmm. you got the, the stylus, and uh, you know you open the uh, open the, the the display, and um, you would. Uh, Use handwriting to mm -hmm. uh, to write on actual it. handwriting. Uh, actual handwriting, and that um, and that the device would would recognize your handwriting, and uh, and turn it into text, um, and uh, it didn't work. Now <laughs> now the 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 thing about it is that you know the Newton was not a successful mass market device. However, the faultiness of the handwriting recognition did break through into sort of mass market consciousness. You know, in the book, I actually reproduce uh, one of the sort of, you know, famous Doonesbury uh, cartoons at the time is that like this was, it was well known enough that the Newton wasn't, wasn't, couldn't understand what you wrote that, that, yeah, this could be a, a joke that, you know, people would see in the, in the, in the funnies, you know, in the, in comic strips. And so this was, um, uh, this, the, the specter of that sort of hung over us, you know, especially with, with every bad demo that we had while we were developing, well, you know, while I was developing the software for this thing, um, um, uh, you know, for the first iPhone, you know, people were just saying, oh, man, it's going to be another Newton. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the, the rest of the device is going to be wonderful. You know, as then there were wonderful qualities, uh, 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 you know, with the Newton. Perhaps the same for the iPhone is that they're going to be, you know, it's going to be a breakthrough, right? This touch operating system, but it's going to fail because people can't enter text to it. Mm -hmm. So that was the worry. Right, because the iPod was a success by then. Uh, a but huge then success. no text required. I mean, there was no text. Right. Right. Of course, you know, then the uh, the click wheel um, was this, um, this wonderful um, um, breakthrough in input methods, right, that made the device, made a thousand songs in your pocket seem like easy to work with mm -hmm. right it's just that navigating through the 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 window uh, the, the you know with, with the little uh, side to side uh, menu interface and in, you know in the little window and the big click wheel below the menu button to go back you know and then the play you know the the the, the you know media controls uh, it just worked for people mm -hmm. right and so that was our dream for the you know for the iphone is that people should be able to just pick it up and use it and not have to pull their hair out mm -hmm. And of course, this was long before Siri. There was no asking to find anything. Oh no, no, no. So, so uh, of course, you know the the uh, the iPhone uh, came out in two thousand seven, um, and Siri was um, 2010, 2011? Yeah. So it was okay. years, years, years later. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about when uh, the the launch of the iPhone, sure. um, you uh, have a great story, a great uh, Bill Atkinson story. Bill, <laughs> who's been on this show and many, and uh, Leo's interviewed him several times. So, so you went when it finally launched. Um, then, t tell the tell us sure, what you sure. did on the day. So, um, so of course, the the iPhone was announced in January of two thousand seven, but we couldn't sell them right away. Uh, there were some regulatory hurdles and things like that. So, so it was, uh, you know, so Apple announced the product months before they were uh, b before it would be uh, available. So then, finally, six months later, in June of 2007, they were they were um, uh, finally going to be uh, uh, available available to, uh, for people to buy in stores. And so on that day, I uh, I didn't go to the office as I usually do. I'm a morning person, so I wake up early, and uh, you know I get to the office, you know, you know around. 8 a.m. or whatever. Well, I didn't do that uh, on on launch day, so instead I hung around at home a little bit uh, 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 later than usual, and then I got in my car uh, and drove from Sunnyvale from my house to Palo Alto, where there is an Apple store. Um, and so I, I I parked the car, and um, there was already this big line of people mm -hmm. um, um, snaking around the around the corner, and so I parked my car and I go and I uh, start walking the line. And um, so, uh, so I, I get about halfway down the block, and um, I, I see in the in the distance there's like some guys got a little clutch of people around him. And he's, he's waving his arms around, and so I get a little closer and I recognize him. And it's Bill Atkinson. It's sort of for people who don't know. Or I'd say Bill Atkinson was the was um, one of the key developers on the original Mac. He developed uh, Mac Paint and HyperCard. I mean, the, the man is a legend. He's a hero of mine. Um, and so, uh, so I see him, I recognize him, um, but he and I had never met. 
and so I just go in and join this little uh, clutch of people. And, and so Bill is, um, his, has, uh, has, has got something in his hands. I mean, he's, you know, and again, he's, he's, he's just, I don't know if you, Bill, he's very, very animated. He's very, very excited. He's just full of energy, full of enthusiasm for everything. And um, so I, I, I asked him, he says, Bill, what is that thing that you're holding? Because it looked like an iPhone. And he said, but it couldn't have been because they weren't on sale yet. Um, and and he, he had left Apple years ago, so there's no way that he could have gotten one, you know. Um, and so he, he showed it to me, and it was this model of a wooden iPhone. So he said he was so, so, so excited about the product, and he wanted one, like, so much that he couldn't wait. And so he has, like, you know, like a, a shop. I don't know if he's got CNC machines or, you know, <laughs> things like that. I mean, he's, you know, he is, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a genius. You know, so, you know uh, thankfully he uses his powers for good. And so he's got this, you know, this shop at home. And so he milled out, you know, his perfect model of an iPhone and then pasted on this, you know, this photo of the clownfish that was used in the mm. or, you know, original marketing uh, just so that he could hold it. Before, you know, see, he made himself a toy iPhone, right? Just, just so he could hold it. And so, and so I'm standing there just like, you know, like marveling, you know, at, you know, being there with Bill, you know, and it just seemed to me like this, this, um, this wonderful, um, this wonderful connection of, you know, sort of old Apple and new Apple. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, I thanked Bill. I, you know, I said, I said, Bill's great. I hope you enjoy your iPhone when you get it, when the line, when you get to the head of the line. And I got back in my car and I drove back to the Apple campus. <laughs> I presume you already had your iPhone at that point. Uh, it's, you know, so um, <laughs> I didn't bring it. I didn't bring it. I, uh, I was right around that time. Uh, so it was actually no. It's it it actually shortly after the announcement that I started having a, a carry, uh, a, a late stage prototype. So I had one, but I, I didn't bring it to the, the mm -hmm. to the to the store. Um, yeah. So what happens on that day? You go back to work and then uh, right. So, so iOS uh, two or <laughs> uh, well, well, right. Well, the first thing that happened was I. Um, um, you know, I had, you know, kind of like, you know, stars in my eyes. I just met one of my heroes um, and, you know, uh, seeing him on the, online there buy his first iPhone. So I get back to campus and um, I badge into the to the hallway and uh, Scott Forstall was was out in the hallway, which is very rare. He was just always so busy and um, uh, he just didn't he was not somebody to hang out, but he was hanging out in the hallway. Um, and so I was like, Scott, and he just like you know, pours a glass of champagne and hands it to me, and we we toasted the iPhone. So that was a, a pretty nice treat too. Um, and so after that, um, yeah, we got back to work. <laughs> So you uh, you write a lot about the demo culture, mm. which is so. I mean, I you know we don't know a lot about this. Um, uh, you're not at Apple anymore, so you're allowed to talk about it. But I mean, what what is it like? I mean, you demoed for Steve, sure. um, and yeah, tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, the you know it you know to like ask the the question. It's like you know what is the design culture at Apple. It's like you turn over so many of these, you know, Apple products, it says designed by Apple in California. It's like, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Right? And I think that the demo culture we the, is, is the, the most concise definition that begins to explain what what it is. How How do we design things at Apple in California? Well, we have this demo culture. And it's certainly something that we used... Uh, to design the software for the the the, the first iPhone and, and many of the products that I worked on, uh, uh, you know, here at the table, iPad and so forth, and what that is is that you you make a demo, the demo represents the stage of the product that you're at. It is the best estimation of the product the final product that you can make given where you are in the in in the in the stage of the project early stage demos sometimes they're just screenshots that are animated together with touch again we were figuring and trying to figure out so much with the touch screen operating system when an app, you know an app goes side to side and then you hit the back button well how fast should that animation be mm -hmm. we made a demo we made a back button and we tested out different animation speeds um, should it be 350 milliseconds, how about 300? Would that be better? I don't know. So we made a demo. 
And so we, 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 we uh, you know, again and again and again and again, we um, created these prototypes that were as much like the final experience as we could. Um, and that's how we went from an idea to a final product. So you talk about the, the seven elements of success, uh, to success at Apple. Yeah. Um, inspiration, collaboration, craft, diligence, decisiveness, taste, and empathy. Empathy, <laughs> yeah. Um, I thought that, I, I really um, thought that was a, a great list. Just, you know, not necessarily for getting a job at Apple or thinking you want to get a but just for, you know, what people might think of in their career. Like, how do they want to do their work? Whatever it is, engineering or talk a little bit about those seven elements. Yeah, well, see, this is, um, I, you know, after I left Apple and, and decided to write this book, I wanted to think back and and say more about you know what was the development culture like. I mean these and these these seven elements is one of the things that I came up with. I tried to think about what did we do every day. If I wanted to distill down, I mean it's like well like lots of other places we had lots of demos, we had meetings, we went to lunch and we talked about the work, right. Um, we, you know, I spent long, long hours sitting in my office, staring at a screen, writing code, um, you know, and, and so to go down to a level deeper than that, to try to figure out, well, what's in common with all of those things? Uh, and, 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 and so if I wanted to think about, well, a good demo, well, what were the elements that went into making that, that good demo? Maybe when we really decided finally on um, what the proper animation speed for that back button was, well, what went into that? Well, taste went into it. I think craft went into it. Uh, you know, the, the animation is just not a linear animation. You know, there's an ease in and ease out. There's some craft and taste associated with that. But yeah, there's also empathy, which, you know, I define as, um, you know, trying to, you know, put yourself in other people's perspective, right? And then creating the work that, that fits people and adapts to their needs. Right and and um, uh, becomes intuitive for them, to, uh, so that the the work explains itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So trying to you know as a product designer, trying to think about you know other people's experiences is a huge part of what went into these products. So um, we got some questions from Twitter. You you asked on Twitter for questions. I asked for um, yeah. qu uh, for questions on Twitter. One person asked you, how uh, did the designers collaborate with one another? Did they use Photoshop? How, how did how did you guys collaborate? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, demos is, is really the best way um, uh, the best way to explain that. But just to really speak to that a little bit more specifically, um, the designers. Okay, so there were really two development teams that made the software, say for the original iPhone, the original iPad. Uh, there's a software engineering team and a team of hum human interface designers, uh, HI designers as we called it. And um, their job was, yeah, I mean, their job was empathy more than anything else, right? Human interface, mm -hmm. right? It's, it, it's right in the name. Um, and so, yeah, they would do work in Photoshop. Sometimes they would send me a Photoshop um, uh, document or even just a small Photoshop file for a button. And very, very quickly, then it was my job to take that and put that into a demo so that we could get it on a screen, right, and start tapping it, right, and start seeing how it moves on the screen, how it looks with all of, if it's a button, how it looks with, how it families. It's just like one of the things that we said all the time. How does that button family with all of the other user interface elements you know if we change the shade of blue by two percent how does that work so yeah we did use photoshop but it was never really like flats of whole screens i would get that and then very very quickly chop that up and get a demo on a device so we could see how it looked as you were holding it in your hand and and, and moving um yeah the amount of thought that goes into these products. I mean, before, uh, one of the first questions I asked you was, you know, what did you do on the Apple Watch? Because that was your last project. And you pointed out that it was your job to do the colon on the time. Yeah. And when I really looked at it, it does have a very, I hate to use the word delightful, but it is delightful the way it flashes. Well, I mean, so so the the, 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 the job there was, well, in, in, in digital times, uh, we wanted the colon to blink once a second. Right, and so um, you know, it was you know, it came to me to to to, uh, to to figure out well, 
how should it blink? You know, what is the you know exact character of it? And you know, it actually you know since you know, many of the animations we try to get them to run at 60 frames per second, I had 60 frames to play with, mm. right? And so I just just broke it down and 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 worked with a, a couple of designers and we we went back and forth. There was this long process of just lovingly crafting those those 60 frames. So look at the colon blink on your digital time if you have an Apple Watch. I mean, it was uh, it was lovingly crafted, right? Crafted with taste and yeah. with, with empathy. And yeah. family. With yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I, and, and, to, and to have it just be one of those things that hopefully um, just feels right. Right, yeah. That you, don't, you don't need to notice it, yeah. right? It, it was the, the effort that we put into it that mm. just seems right mm -hmm. and great. And, and so that if, if you don't notice it, uh, you know, but then if you do look at it and it's success, great, I, I, I consider that a success. Uh, someone else asked, uh, what aspects of the design do you regret? <laughs> well, you know, I, you know, there, there are no, there are no real regrets. No real regrets. No regrets. Um, uh, you know, I did the best I could. Um, and, and I know that uh, all of my colleagues did as well. I mean, if, if I, you know, but to give an answer to the question is I'm sorry that it took so long to get co copy paste, mm. you know, on, on the iPhone. I mean, it was, uh, it was my job to, um, to do not only the keyboard, but the whole text system. So the, uh, you know, the loop that, you know, the little magnifying loop that, you know, comes up above your, your finger to place the insertion point um, was, was in the first version of the software, but I, I simply didn't have time to do keyboard and autocorrection and develop the dictionary and do the, the text, multi-line text uh, feel, uh, text areas for notes and text fields for the contact uh, cards. And, and then year two, we did the developer APIs. And so it just took, you know, a, a long time to get around to cut, copy, paste. So, I mean, that's, I, I wish we could have gone faster, but... Um, it wasn't like you hadn't thought about it. It was... <laughs> oh, we, but you see, but interestingly, you know, and, and so that's one of the other essential elements that I talk about is decisiveness, mm -hmm. is that I did not work on it in those first two years or in the development phase uh, before that, starting from 2005. I did not work on... Um, um, text selection or cut, copy, paste. We just decided that, no, that was going to have to be later. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we spent all of our time working on the things that we did ship. Mm -hmm. uh, what, um, I guess there was a question about UI scroll view. Do you mm. remember what the question was? All I wrote down was UI yeah, scroll. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, because, you know, UI scroll view is, um, um, is a piece of the uh, developer frameworks that delivers um, by default, developers, third-party developers, uh, and also uh, in Apple intern internal developers can take that component and put it in their apps to get that beautiful inertial scrolling. So you have a list of items in your app, whatever it is, you know, a list of songs, a list of contacts, you know, a list of calendar events, you know, whatever it is, mail messages or whatever third-party developer might have. and But that behavior is the same because all, all developers are using UI scroll view. And so the, 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 the question uh, from Twitter was, you know, what was the team that developed it? And, you know, and, you know, the funny thing is, again, there was one engineer working on it. You know, and you know, and pretty much you know, one designer. But again, there was a lot of collaboration. Uh, you know, uh, of people. You know, lo again, lovingly crafted that that slow down and that rubber banding. How much should it rubber band? Um, and so, um, y y there was a tremendous amount of effort that was devoted to that to get it right mm -hmm. for that that first. Um, that first uh, um, release of the iPhone. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you uh, many, many, many hours, um, days, weeks, months. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, what changed between, this is another question from Twitter, what changed between iOS 1 and iOS 2? You know, I'm, I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way. Um, the, uh, you know, I, well, I can give a quick answer. What changed between iOS 1 and 2 was we made the developer API, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, uh, it's like one of the things is like the, uh, the, the widget in, in notes um, was deemed not good enough. So it was actually rewritten. So I had written the original one that was used in notes and then a one that was good enough for, for third-party developers was, uh, was made from scratch by um, um, 
a better de better framework developer than me. Um, but uh, so let me answer this question in, in another way: is that um, uh, the uh, on stage apps like Stocks and Weather were web apps, and so between the time of of the uh, the announcement. Um, uh, that Steve, you know, held up the first iPhone for everybody to see, and and the first cu customer shipments, they were rewritten in Objective C, mm -hmm. you know, in in code rather than 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 as a a, a web app. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like one of those things that they were deemed not good enough, the performance wasn't good enough, and so people just um, you know put their nose to the grindstone and, and re rewrote them as uh, native apps for that first release. So Brian Merchant wrote um, The One Device about the creation of the iPhone, and you haven't read it, as good writers do. They don't want to read similar I was, books. I was in the, as, I, as I said to you off camera beforehand, yeah. as I was in the midst of writing my book, so I just didn't, I, you know, I didn't want, I, you know, I was expecting it to be good, so, you know, I just didn't, like, want to um, have that in my mind, yes. But one of the things he talks a lot about is uh, how the people working on the iPhone just, like, nearly oh. killed themselves, ruined marriages, like, they were just... Um, just worked so hard. It, was that, I don't get that in your book. Right. Was that your experience? It was not my experience. Um, part of, you know, I always looked at work as a marathon, not a sprint. And that um, I, I, I try to keep very regular hours. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of stress. And I talk about it in the book, the one time I was, yeah, yes, I did lose my temper one day and shouted at somebody to get the whatever out of my office. Just and, one day? <laughs> yeah, just, just one day. Well, I, I, I try not to lose my temper. But, but yeah, it did boil over sometimes, yes. But, you know, I figured that the way to prevent that from happening more often was to just keep regular hours. Mm. Now, of course, I would go home and I'd be up, you know, at night looking at the ceiling, thinking about work. And I, you know, but, you know, part of it was just a coping mechanism to try to just keep hours under control. I mean, I don't really know how other people did it. Um, some, as, you know, as Brian Merchant, you know, talked about, um, that, yes, some, you know, some marriages got wrecked. I don't know if that was so much in the software organization. Mm -hmm. But, um, and, you know, obviously, I mean, I talk about software development in my book, but obviously there was, you know, hardware development and, you know, there's people, you know, doing the marketing and the industrial design and then the radios and trying to get, you know, ramp up uh, manufacturing, supply chain. I mean, there's a tremendous amount that goes into making a product like this. But in the software organization, I think for the most part, we managed to keep a lid on the pressure cooker. And how about those demos? Did you have to, like, were, did you go in with a thick skin? Like, I, I know you describe some situations where it's kind of like, oh, that doesn't, you know, we don't oh, like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, people, demos. See, another real aspect of the demo culture, which I should be clear to talk about, is that the feedback was always very frank. Very, very frank, especially with Steve, um, but not only with him. I mean, this part of the idea is, and I talk about a, a couple of demos that I gave to Steve in the book, um, um, you know, to give that to give that flavor. But uh, a part of it is to is to give that flavor, but then to also give the sense that Steve created the model for all of the other demos that we did every day mm -hmm. or uh, with Scott periodically, you know, every week or, you know, week or so. Um, it, so this very, very frank, very, very straightforward feedback of what people like, what they don't, what are the strong aspects of the work, why an aspect is strong. Not that I like something, I don't like something, um, but why we liked it why we think an aspect of, of work is strong or uh, correspondingly whether uh, a piece of work is, is weak. And, and so it's that frank feed feedback that kind of keeps the, uh, the, the, the demo process going. And it's the reason that I called the book Creative Selection. It's this long evolutionary process of creativity to just building on the strong aspects of the work, keeping those, discarding the weak, and just you know, going and going and going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all the feedback has to be very, very frank in order for that to happen. 
Uh, this is more of a, a technical question. Um, well, not really technical. Why not a row of numbers on the keyboard? Um, this is what Al asked on Twitter. And I have to press the number keys or swipe with various success to produce something as simple as a phone number. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you see, well, I, I, I think that's an interesting question. It's like, I, you know, I apologize, you know, if you need to, uh, uh, you know, enter in a phone number in the middle of um, regular text. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the you know, ideas that I came up with, and it was available even in the uh, in the first iPhone, was the idea that a text field can tell the keyboard what kind of data it contains. Mm. So that if you went into the contacts app, for instance, and and just you, you know went through it, when you enter in the person's name, you'll get the alphanumeric. Sorry, excuse me. You'll get the alphanumeric keyboard. But when you go to their phone number it'll change to a number pad. When you go to enter in the state abbreviation, the keyboard will go to all caps. Mm. So, and that, that this um, um, little hint can be provided by, by the developer to tell the keyboard what kind of, um, what kind of data is, um, um, is, is going to be entered so the keyboard can customize itself. Try to be a little bit empathetic mm -hmm. again. Um, you know, but the keyboard was just too small to have numbers the whole time. And so the last thing that I would say about that is that we thought about the trade-off of do we take up more screen real estate to add yet another row on top? And correspondingly, you know, on this, you know, original phone, do we take up, you know, you know one more row and there, thereby diminish the amount of um, screen real estate available for the, for the content? You know, so so it's kind of a long answer, but I just kind of give you the idea that we thought about it. Yeah. Well, it's funny when you say I, I've never noticed that about the entering the um, you know the all caps and the state and the number, and it's like there are negative bias, right? We only notice when something doesn't do right. what we want it to do. We never we don't notice right. when it does what we want it to do. Right. Well, I mean, to me, that is a hugely important aspect of product development, is that as much as possible you you want to you know, you want people to be delighted by the product you want people to have positive experiences but at the same time you want to prevent negative experiences mm -hmm. and that it can't be an even trade off mm -hmm. oh well i have one good experience mm -hmm. and one negative experience so they cancel out no that's mm -hmm. not how it works you need to have you know, my, my mind is 99 positive experiences to counterbalance the one negative one i mean i want that to, 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 to you know, the chips to be stacked as high as possible on the pro positive side so that, yes, when sometimes the gears do grind a little bit, um, that it's so infrequent, as infrequent as possible, that people, just, you know, still wind up having a smile on their face. Right. Um, I think we, were, we have a question in our chat room about how many hours a day was your average work day? You know, I try, you know, I try to keep it, you know, around nine, you know, you know 10 was... Not uncommon. Longer than that is no good. Yeah. I mean, you kind of your brain turns to mush after a mm -hmm. while. I mean, especially since the majority of my days was writing code, mm -hmm. sitting, looking at you know a screen of text and trying to figure out how to make the software do something different than what it was doing. You know, and after a certain point, um, you know, I you know I I was you know 40 years old. I wasn't 20 years old mm -hmm. when I was working on the iPhone. I was 40 years old. Um, so, you know, at, at, at a certain, at a certain point you have to, you know, take care of, uh, you know, the, you know, the, your, your, your brain, you know, uh, you know, otherwise, yeah, you will uh, not be able to keep up the marathon. Were most of your team around your age or were they younger or there were, older? There were a lot of people right around my age. Yeah. It's right. Richard Williamson mm -hmm. is, I think was born within a couple of months of me. Mm -hmm. uh, Henri Lemiro, our manager, was, uh, you know, even just a couple of years older. Uh, Scott Forstall is a couple of years younger. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Greg Christie, who was, uh, you know, running the human interface team. Yeah, right around my age as well. There was a variety of people right in that, right in that age group. And, and younger, there were a couple of people younger working on the iPhone. But I would say, um, yeah, I was maybe close to the average age, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question from Twitter. Um, did you test iPhone interaction concepts with users? Scrolling inertia, chessboard patterns, back button, et cetera. And how did user reach search or testing affect what you made? Okay, so so w in a way, we I, I was lucky in my career. 
in that, uh, did I test products with users? Yes. Uh, and the, the users were the people around me. You know, see, you know, part of the difficulty was that we were developing these products in such secrecy. Mm -hmm. But the advantage was that the products were for us. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, and so in, to provide a contrast, it's not like I was developing a piece of medical equipment mm -hmm. where a doctor was the user, right? Where it needs to now do what the doctor is, makes sense to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not a doctor. So how do I figure out what is going to make sense to the, to the real user of the product? And so we tried to make the products for everybody. Um, and so uh, we were lucky in that regard so that I could come up with a, a, a prototype, a, you know, a demo, you know, and, to, and show it to, you know, to the person in the next office. And we were the target audience. Mm -hmm. We were the one who wanted this wonderful iPhone. We wanted to take our cell phones that we had and throw them away mm -hmm. and make something better. So, yeah, did we test products with users? Yes. I mean, I understand that this is a kind of a, you know, maybe a little, little bit of a snarky answer. But that's how we thought about it. We, and, and, and that's, again, why empathy was such an important part of the you know the, the 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 development process and to just say one more thing about that is that we worked with the accessibility team at Apple to make sure that the product would work with people who you know need assistance to see or need assistance to hear or need assistance with with touch maybe their hands aren't as steady as they used to be um, and so we had, you know, there's a huge team of, of incredibly talented people at Apple who focus on accessibility. And, and we, you know, that's, you know, a, you know again, so do we do we're with users? Yes. You can hand the phone to people who need to have the font to be 120 points in order to see it. So, yeah, we did. Do you remember something that was changed after with input from the accessibility team? Oh, absolutely. So now this is skipping ahead uh, uh, to many, many uh, later uh, uh, versions. But um, um, one of the things that um, um, changed in iOS 7 was uh, a lot of the user interface elements became went changed from blue to white, mm -hmm. right? The blue background became a white background. Mm -hmm. And so the screen, on average, became brighter. And uh, some uh, some people um, have a real sensitivity to brightness, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, they couldn't look at the screen. I mean, it's almost like, you know, here I am looking, you know, looking at some of the lights here, and they're a little bit too bright. So what am I going to do? I'm going to squint. It's a little not comfortable to stare at directly. And so some people had that with just the brightness level on the screen. And so uh, for iOS 8, one of the projects that I did was I worked with the accessibility team to uh, add in a control that would take the overall brightness level of the screen, change the gamma of the display so that uh, just changing the curve so that black stayed black, but that white just wasn't going to be as bright, mm -hmm. that we just added a little bit of a little bit of a change in the curve so that you know, white was only 95% uh, as, as white. And the people on the accessibility team said, said, and that they then reached out to people in their community, uh, said, yeah, that this is, this is going to work for us. And uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, this, this, this kind of work happens. I, I'm going to ask one more question because I know we've been talking for a long time. Um, Ed asked, how do you recognize a trade-off between form and function? And if so, how do, you how do you adjudicate it? It feels like Apple often favors form over function and makes us adapt rather than adapt to us. Okay, so I can I can certainly speak for um, for the time that I you know that I was at Apple, and you know I can give you know an answer which then people can maybe find even more examples about in my book. So I talk about uh, you know working or, you know around the years around the time of the iPhone, and so my answer to that is design is how it works. That is my philosophy, and it's not just mine. I mean, this is this is uh, we, something that came directly from Steve. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, it's one of the, it's probably the, my favorite thing that I ever heard Steve say. It was actually in an article uh, published in the New York Times uh, where Steve was talking about the iPod. Um, and Steve said something to the effect of, you know, people think that design is, well, you give the designers a box and, you know, the, 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 the brief is just make this thing look good. And that's not how we work. Design is how it works. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully in the conversation you hear, uh, and hopefully if you get the book and read it, that you, you'll hear that, um, um, that to me, um, 
the, the you know the the form needs to follow the function you know mm -hmm. it, which again even sounds funny when it comes to pixels on a screen is that the, you know the the device should tell you how to use it it's eventually why we chose a qwerty keyboard mm -hmm. because it was the most obvious right uh, I, we tried as I talk about in the book many different designs that that weren't the most obvious thing and so to me design is how it works how do we adjudicate that well you know again we were we were the users for these products you know so um, you know, so, you know, it, you know, to me, it is, um, you know, one of the most important threads that runs through the work that I did in my career was to be empathetic and to have it be design, design is how it works. Well, there's so much more in this book. I could talk for the next three hours with you or more. Um, but we have not spoiled the good meat of the book. There's so many. There's a lovely story of your last demo with Steve in here. There's so many more interesting like trial and error stories. Uh, creative selection. Ken Kashenda inside Apple's design process during the golden age of Steve Jobs is available now. Unless you're watching this live, then it's available for pre-order now. Uh, you can also get the audiobook. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it in your local bookstore. Um, at it's it's a great book and highly recommend it. Ken Kashenda, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Well, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks for, the for time. having me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> And thank you for watching Triangulation. Triangulation records every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific. And uh, you can join us live usually, or you can uh, download it. You can watch or you can listen. It's wherever you get your podcasts. You can get it. We'd love for you to subscribe. Go to twit.tv slash try to find out all the ways you can subscribe. I am Megan Maroney, and we'll see you next week.